Since the beginning of time, tricksters, the mythical origin, or all clowns have embraced life's paradoxes, creating coherence through confusion, adding disorder into the world in order to expose its lies and speak the truth. This is a quote from the manifesto written by Circa, the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army. Yes, you heard me right. While I was on one of my nightly Wikipedia rabbit hole sessions, I came across this insane title. Circa is a self-proclaimed UK-based clown civil disobedience group that arose in 2003 in response to George W. Bush's visit to the UK. Ellen Bogad was a co-founder of Circa and participated in this initial protest against Bush's visit. If you guys don't know, 2003 was the year in which Bush launched his deadly invasion of Iraq because Saddam Hussein allegedly possessed WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. Of course, these WMDs were never found, but this was the war that killed hundreds of thousands of people, including civilians. In recounting the early phases of the movement, Bogan mentioned Circa's unique methods of civil disobedience. For example, in order to counter police brutality that would often be taking place during protests, the clowns filled their pockets with sex toys, flowers, and bouncy balls to make fun of the police who searched them, and to bring attention to the over-policing of legal public assemblies, which is a huge problem. The group consisted of a range of different personalities, from professional clowns who were seeking radicalization to progressive military veterans who witnessed the atrocities of war firsthand. Regardless, each member was anti-war. Circa was a primarily defensive organization, which sought to protect activists from the state and to shift negative attention away from the anti-war protesters, which happens a lot in the media who's trying to portray a narrative. As Bogad puts it himself, quote, the clown puts their absurd body in the way of the harm of others, creating a whimsical line of clowns between the police and the protesters, a clownish membrane that can be swept away like a gossamer, but with a sociocultural price of mediated, disseminated, and spectacularly absurd brutality. I have read about guerrilla warfare, hunger strikes, and even guillotines, but never in my three years of studying history did I think I would come across revolutionary clowning. This little area in history was quite a treat for me. <laughs> At first, I was hesitant to look into this, but as I read more and more, this seemingly absurd concept began to make sense. Soon, I began to realize that Circa was not a unique movement and that clowning has existed as a form of civil disobedience for centuries and throughout history. In this video, we are going to explore the historical roots of humor and absurdism as a means of challenging societal structures from the medieval period to the Iraq War. According to the scholar Adrienne L. Despot, the clown archetype has existed in nearly every society, but it manifests differently according to time and place. Most famously, in the medieval courts of England, jesters wore motley garments and served as unofficial advisors for the king, like Henry VIII. In traditional Chinese dramas, the Cho are foolish and comical characters that accompany percussion in Peking opera. The indigenous Pueblo people of Southwest America have their own clown archetypes within the Kachita religion that perform rituals for weather and to counter black magic. Regardless of these cultural and periodic differences, however, the author argues that four core principles remain constant in each manifestation, regardless of time or place. Number one, quote, clowns exploit ambiguous and multiple illusions of identity. Number two, quote, they obstruct or divert pattern behavior. Number three, quote, they have magical powers. And number four, quote, they are outcasts. For the purpose of this video, we are going to be focusing on the second principle, the diversion of pattern behavior. Despot continues saying, quote, just mentioning a clown's marching band produces a very precise image. The organization needs a leader, but clowns terrorize their conductor. 
marching off with serious snappy steps at different speeds and at different directions." End quote. The goal of the clown in this situation is to interfere with an established order, to introduce chaos into an orderly structure in order to bring out the absurdities of said structure. This is why we often see clown figures in orderly settings, where disobedience is not typically tolerated. According to the scholar William Walford, we find joy in clowns because of their ability to bend social norms without facing any actual repercussions, a liberty that's not afforded to most. Oftentimes, clowns are the only people with the power to break the unbreakable, and they end up expressing a degree of freedom that the masses crave, which is why we cherish their performance so dearly. As Despot puts it, quote, there's power in this capacity to dissolve patterns and structures. The cross-cultural appearances and long history and existence of the clown archetype can tell us a number of different things about society as a whole. Psychologically, it could be a universal method of releasing stress, through laughter. Sociologically, it could be a way that humans express individuality when they are pressured to conform. However, I am a history major, so historically, clowning could be interpreted as a universal means of challenging a social structure. According to the founders of Circa, the group, quote, aims to make clowning dangerous again to bring it back to the streets, restore its disobedience, and give it back the social function it once had, its ability to disrupt, critique, and heal society. When I first read this quote, I audibly laughed because it seemed like an absurd and idealistic concept. I mean, how could clownery be a form of civil disobedience? Much less, how could it serve as a form of anti-militarism? These are two very contrasting issues we have here. However, as I dug deeper into the ideology of this group, it slowly started to make sense. Circa did not come up with this idea from scratch. In fact, they claimed to be heavily inspired by historical absurdist movements and figures. One of their historical sources for inspiration were the fools or jesters of the 15th and 16th centuries, who were able to deliver critique to their sovereigns without facing any actual repercussions for it. For many kings, jesters were some of the greatest advisors because they were able to outwardly critique their rule under the guise of a jest. Circa's most interesting inspiration, however, is the 20th century Russian scholar Mikhail Bakhtin. While Bakhtin is most renowned for his critique of Dostoevsky, the founders of Circa focus on his theory of the carnivalesque. In his book, Rabelais in the World, Bakhtin writes about the 16th century French novelist Francois Rabelais, who Bakhtin believed to exemplify the carnival view of the world. Rabelais wrote extensively about clowns in medieval culture, especially carnival, and how it was one of the few moments in which chaos was not only allowed, but encouraged by the church. Instead of being expected to follow stingy social rules, the reversal of hierarchy was celebrated during the medieval carnival. Carnival activities, from plays to processions, were conducted in a distorted fashion. Stories were told about the mythical land of Cockade, a medieval paradise in which the social order was reversed and consumption was not regulated at all. The people were free to do as they pleased without the scrutiny of the church telling them to not consume and not engage in opulence. It represented the polar opposite of the medieval peasant life. The myth of cocaine was initially derived from a satirical poem that condemned the Cistercians, a Catholic order of monks and nuns that were suspected to have engaged in ungodly and sinful behaviors. So while the myth of cocaine began as a condemnation of sin, it became a way that peasants could scrutinize the church's standards and indulge. While it was intended to be a warning of ungodly society, the myth actually ended up appealing to the lower classes. During carnival, peasants would recreate role reversals, reversals of hierarchy, from gender to class by cross-dressing, role-playing as kings and clergy, and making fun of Catholic religious rituals. 
So why on earth would the church promote such activities, such ungodly activities? Well, the carnival was conducted to show a visual representation of sin. It was essentially a way of showing how crazy society would be if not for the presence of the church, who had near absolute power over Western Europe during the medieval period. Essentially, carnival was a fear-mongering tactic, a way of legitimizing the church's religious authority by demonstrating the work of sin and what society could be. In developing the theory of carnivalesque, however, Bakhtin argues that the carnival had the complete opposite effect, similar to the myth of cocaine. He states, quote, The principle of laughter and the carnival spirit on which the grotesque is based destroys this limited seriousness in all pretense of an extratemporal meaning, an unconditional value of necessity. It frees human consciousness, thought, and imagination for new potentialities. Bakhtin believed that the carnival was a means of exposing the corrupt hierarchies of society by making them look absurd or laughable. The laughter of the medieval serfs during carnival became a revolutionary cry against their feudal masters. Now let's take a look at some of the examples of the carnivalesque as it was applied in history. Let's travel forward after the medieval period. In the 15th and 16th centuries, monarchs would often take in individuals with mental and or physical disabilities as court fools. Disability historians speculate that these fools may have had cognitive disabilities like autism spectrum disorder. You can check out my video here if you want to see more about that. The courts were fascinated and often idealized what they called natural fools because of their godlike ability to deliver the blunt truth and also because they did not really care to flatter the king. Since natural fools were straightforward and defied social norms, they could deliver genuine criticism to the throne without being seen as malicious or conspiratory. And also because society infantilized the disabled, there was no perceived threat in this advice. Many historians regard the court jester as an unofficial bridge between the king and his people. Needless to say, they were very impactful. However, I believe the carnivalesque method was most effectively used to make fun of war and militarism. Let's fast forward a few hundred years in the future. The 18th and 19th centuries were periods of unprecedented industrial growth in Western Europe, also known as the Industrial Revolution. During this period, inventions like steam engines and the telegraph mechanized society at a rapid rate and created a much more connected continent. However, the newly formed states of Western Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries were also beginning to get their hands on artillery, tanks, and eventually the atomic bomb due to this rapid industrialization. So when a few revolutionary individuals are up against an industrial powerhouse, a war machine, the odds are eventually stacked against the individuals. They don't have artillery, they don't have tanks, what are they supposed to do? However, clowning was a means of using the astronomical power imbalance against itself to turn it on its head. It was a means of drastically changing public opinion by showing the true absurdities of war. I mean, if you take a step back, you'll soon realize that the very concept of war is kind of funny. I mean, what were the Nazis really fighting for? A guy with a funny mustache and an inferiority complex because he was rejected from art school? While this narrative is theatrical and absurd, it takes away from any legitimacy that the guy claimed to have. It is powerful in its own weird way. I mean, who would follow the orders of a buffoon? Who would follow the orders of a fool? This is the exact message that Charlie Chaplin sought to deliver in his 1940 film, The Great Dictator. The story follows two characters, both played by Chaplin. There was Adenoid Heinkel, a dictator who served as a metaphor for Adolf Hitler, and a poor Jewish barber who is trying to survive this fascist regime. 
Chaplin was a comedian, not a politician, not a spokesperson. So he used his skill set to his advantage and managed to portray the fascist nations as absurd and illegitimate, with no guns, with no artillery. While the film does use comedy to mock Hitler himself, its most profound message was his call to action. The famous last speech puts it best. Quote, Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as a cannon fodder, don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, only the unloved and the unnatural. In the 21st century, it's easy to look back at this film and undermine its impact because we think too highly of the people of the past. I mean, wasn't the free world already waging a full-scale war against the Nazis at this point? Well, not entirely. The preparation of The Great Dictator began in 1938, just a year before the Second World War. In 1938, Britain was still maintaining its appeasement policy towards Germany. The US did not intend to interfere. Appeasement is a practice of giving in to the demands of the enemy in order to further prevent disagreement. Because of the neutrality of the US and Britain, Chaplin's colleagues warned him not to release the film. They believed that the US and Britain would censor Chaplin for putting in supposedly anti-Hitler message. Unfortunately, his colleagues were right because in the early stages of the film's production, Britain pledged to censor his film and prohibit its exhibition because of their appeasement policy. But this did not stop the determined Chaplin, because he continued to passionately work on this film for months on end. Eventually, Britain allowed the film to be released in 1940 because they finally decided to wage war against Germany. However, the US was still neutral, despite the looming threat of a fascist Europe and maybe a fascist world. While the world's most powerful nations were cowering in fear, Chaplin dared to laugh in the face of fascism. The film The Great Dictator is the perfect embodiment of the carnivalesque, because through humor and chaos, Chaplin is able to portray the sheer absurdities of war, and he calls upon the people and governments of the free world to fight back. It invalidates the fascist message by making fun of dictators and their subservient followers. It makes fun of the serious aesthetics of fascism. For the powerless, humor served as a form of cultural propaganda in order to combat the widely distributed militaristic propaganda during the period. I mean, sometimes I get mad at those alt-right kids online, but then I ask myself what kind of serious person would make little dark age edits out the side who lost? Yeah, probably scrawny 14 year olds at the suburbs with nicotine addictions or neckbeards that live in their mom's basement. So now that we've got the historical context for their inception, let's circle back to the Cloud Army. Ellen Bogad, remember this was one of the group founders, states that, quote, the clown talks through the media, not to the media. We know they will cover us in a dismissive way, but we want to insert a kernel of truth into the middle of the absurd behavior, end quote. Essentially, their mission is to bring attention to social issues by adopting the carnivalesque method. There are several strong elements to this group. Number one, their self-awareness. Members of Circa recognize that their goal is to protect the voices of serious activists. They don't make the mistake of speaking over the activists and stepping over the line. Number two, their strategy is pretty solid. They seek to make fun of the over-policing of legal public assembly. They put themselves in harm's way by diverting negative press coverage. And number three, they do a pretty good job at disarming militants by outright confusing them at times. Bogad mentions, quote, 
In one instance, a 70-person strong gaggle of clowns walked straight through a line of UK riot cops, who, strangely, could not hold their line. When the video footage of the event was examined, it turned out that beneath their visors, the cops were laughing too much to be able to concentrate. However, it is also important to recognize the flaws of this movement, and why it may not always be the most effective method. Oftentimes, clowning is not appropriate when activists seek to emphasize the seriousness of an issue. Remember the Charlie Chaplin film I mentioned earlier? Well, years after the war ended and the atrocities that Hitler committed came to light, Charlie Chaplin stated that he would not have made the great dictator if he had known the full story. Of course, I don't blame him for not knowing, and it was a great way of leveraging support against the Axis powers, but one can understand why the film did not appeal to a lot of people, especially when looking at it through a modern lens. Another issue is that the presence of clowns at protests can take away from the legitimacy of the voices of serious activists. Activists often suffer from intentionally negative press coverage. Because of this, the occasional positive coverage can be a massive win for their cause. But having people dressed up as clowns at your protest could overshadow the importance of your message. And the press could easily delegitimize your movement as a whole. Clowning could have the polar opposite effect, making a mockery of the oppressed instead of the oppressors. Lastly, since anti-authoritarian clowning does not have a rigid sense of principles, the movement could easily be co-opted. This becomes clear when looking back at the history of clowns as a whole. The principles of clowning were that of absurdity, humor, and rebellion. Many people became clowns to challenge these societal norms and express their individuality in a society that stressed conformity. But not every clown's intentions were pure. In the 19th century, when slavery was a debate, some clowns upheld this backward system by putting on blackface and exaggerating the features of African Americans. They hosted minstrel shows in which white folk went on stage and made a mockery of African American culture, songs, mannerisms, in order to dehumanize them and invalidate the abolitionist movement. While clowns today stand against these racist caricatures, it's a significant part of history that often goes unnoticed and is brushed aside. Many performance artists treat the minstrel shows as simply a stain on their history. But artists and historians alike must analyze how this art was leveraged to perpetrate such an abhorrent system in order to prevent it from happening again. If clowning was co-opted in the past, what's stopping it from being co-opted again today? These are some of the many pitfalls that come with political performance art as a whole. It's a tricky medium. Snivy little freaks will always find their way into groups that don't have a solid structure or through ambiguous leftist art mediums. Circa's last official gathering took place in 2005 to protest against the annual G8 forum. This was a political forum that brought together Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, the UK, and the US for the purpose of resolving global issues. I mean, were the richest imperialist powers in the world really gathered there to discuss international aid? Or is this just another way of increasing their own economic prosperity at the expense of the global south? Circa recognized this, so when the G8 forum was being hosted, they participated in nuclear blockades, they hosted their own illegal bakhtin style carnival, they blocked roads, and they even protested outside the forum building. In their own unique clownish methods. While their reason for the decline after the G8 summit is not entirely clear, the group inspired several clown army offshoots all over the world. While Sugar Circa was a short-lived movement, I'm a little sad they didn't get more media coverage. I mean, maybe they did in the early 2000s, but they don't seem to be well recognized or even heard of today. And I hope to do that with this video. Of course, there are several flaws to this movement, and I'm really glad they did not rise to fame on social media because boy oh boy could that take a twist for the worse. The time and effort they put into this deserves some kind of attention. Using humor as a form of activism can have its pros and its cons. 
but it's certainly one of the most fascinating methods I have ever encountered in history. What do you guys think about Circa? About comical activism as a whole? Let me know in the comments below. I would be happy to read them. As always, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and have a very silly rest of your day.